All right, all right. We're back with another panel from Changeville Music and Arts Festival 2018. As you know, the Changeville Festival is all about highlighting artists and activists that are making a difference in our world. And during this festival that took place on February 8th and 9th of 2018, we hosted a few panels and we recorded them to share with you, uh, those of you who were not able to be in the room, and this panel that we're presenting today on the Changeville podcast is called The Other, De-Othering Through Art. This was one of the most popular panels of Changeville this year. The concept behind it is the following. So much of the rhetoric we hear on the news, in politics, and in our daily lives is based around fear, and specifically fear of the other. It's fairly easy to believe false statements about people whose stories we haven't heard. Art is one of the most powerful ways that we can de-other people. This panel explores how we can use art to break down stigmas and stereotypes using art. The panelists include Chad Moses of To Write Love on Her Arms, Talia Raymond, a minister at the United Church of Gainesville as well as a professional dancer, Gainesville-based author Mallory O'Connor, Hazel Levy, an organizer with the National Women's Liberation Women of Color Caucus, a scientist and an artist, and the moderator was Nicole Harris, a teacher at GHS who runs Canes on the Mic, which is a program that Changeville has partnered with the last couple years. The work that Canes on the mic does and Nicole does facilitating it is just incredible so look it up that's my little recommendation for the day the beginning of this panel the first couple of minutes didn't get recorded so it'll jump in uh, after a couple of introductions have already been made just a little uh, note there thanks to our audio editor Ian Mikeish for this episode um, it's worth noting that there's a lot of communication between the audience and other audience members and the panel and some of the people sitting farthest away from the mic are going to be a little bit soft in this recording also um, there were some uh, interpersonal activities that were cut from this recording because i mean i don't think you want to hear 10 minutes of background noise essentially so here are our panelists jumping right in I'll go first. Mallory O'Connor and I'm a retired art historian from the University of Florida at Santa Fe and directed the Thomas Center Gallery for a number of years and uh, when I retired from my academic career I started writing fiction so I've been enjoying writing fiction that has to do with social justice issues immigration and uh, uh, prejudice and gay and lesbian issues and prejudice against women and so on. So, and mental health issues as well. And my debut novel just came out in July. Oh, (laughs) thank you. Um, Before I introduce myself, I don't think anyone's gonna be coming back behind Nicole, so um, I'm sure we could probably fill in as, in as close proximity as you desire. Uh, I, can bring, I can bring more chairs. I'm the house man, so if you have any needs um, or desires, if I can accommodate, I'd love to, including more seating. Right on. Um, and for those of you that are moving, am I projecting decently? Yeah. Just, okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> so my name is uh, Chad Moses. I work for a nonprofit organization called To Write Love on Her Arms. And we exist to present hope and find help for anyone struggling with depression, addiction, self-injury, and suicide. Uh, My role specifically with the organization is uh, finding creative ways to work within the world of live music uh, to use a platform of live music to create a conversation uh, around mental health. All right, so, yes, sorry. Are we okay over here? You guys are okay over here. Uh, my name is Talia Raymond. I'm currently serving as one of the associate ministers at United Church of Gainesville. If you don't know who we are, we're a very progressive congregation, um, melding a lot of faith traditions and spiritualities. Uh, and my background is in dance. I was a professional modern dancer with Omega West in San Francisco, and we did a lot of our um, 
number as a, uh, performance pieces were um, interfaith numbers and social justice causes. And so my background is in the arts, and my specific focus at UCG is the arts and youth. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm Hazel Levy. Um, I have a, wear a couple different hats, as we all do. But um, I am a, the vice chair of the Women of Color Caucus of the Gainesville chapter of National Women's Liberation. And we are a radical feminist group with roots since the 60s. Um, some of the women that started this group were the rabble of rousers that broke into legislation in New York to get the ball rolling for a few ways. So we're in the modern synthesis of that tradition. And I'm also a professor at University of Florida at the College of Medicine. I have a research lab in biochemistry and cancer biology. And I'm the first African American woman born in the United States to ever have a research lab in the College of Medicine at UF in the 61 years that it's existed. Great. Wow. Both good and horrifying. Right. <laughs> I say it because it sounds weird when I say it. And, uh, and so with that, there is some social justice stuff going on there as well um, with kind of normalizing the presence of non-white men in academia. You know, that's everywhere. That's work, <laughs> work that, as well, I, that I don't get paid for in my capacity as a professor that all right, thank you. Can we clap it up for panelists? All right, my name is Nicole Harris, and I am a teacher at Gainesville High School, and I teach ninth and 12th grade English. I teach ninth graders that are struggling, and I teach 12th graders that are um, preparing for college, um, the college prep course. I also am the founder and director of the Canes on the Mic Poetry Club, and we are a youth literary organization and a civic engagement organization. And we serve youth ages 13 through 19. And um, we have a diverse population. It's all original poetry. They are professionally trained and coached to perform and to see their art um, as justice as well. Um, and that's what I do in the community. And I'm going to give Anne a little introduction so she gives a large introduction because I'm so grateful to her being here. Um, being that I work within the Alachua County Public System, you may or may not know um, that we won a prize in Alachua. Don't get too happy. Um, we have one of the largest gaps in Florida between black and white students um, achieving. So um, because of that, um, they, they created an equity department, an equity office, and they're developing and they're starting out. This year was your first year? And so when I met Anne, I thought it was really important for her to be here. So I really appreciate you being here. It's kind of last minute. I was like, wait, she's perfect for this. <laughs> um, and Anne is the equity coach. And she's, I've seen Anne just be really present in schools, be present listening to teachers, seeing what's happening, and how she can come alongside them. Um, I first met Anne when she came to our school to talk about equity. So I'm going to let her do the rest of the introduction herself. But I'm so happy that she's here and doing equity work and starting that process. And I think it's just going to be a great addition to today. So yeah, I'm Ann Wolf. I uh, that was a beautiful introduction. I don't have tons more to say, but I think we can think about an achievement gap, and often it is referred to as an achievement gap. But my preference is to refer to it as an education debt because it's public education, and this is something that we owe students, and we have yet to figure out how to give them access to the education that they deserve. Um, so a part of that work, and probably one of the biggest parts of my work, is being out in the community, um, mostly of teachers and administrators, having conversations that center around one thing. Black children are humans, right? And so this concept of, um, what is it, de-othering, yes. right? So this concept of de-othering, right? So it's really a process. De-othering is a process of humanizing. When you other, you dehumanize, right? And I think, um, I'm so grateful to you for inviting me here because I so rely on the work that Nicole is doing with Canes on a Mic because that is yet another tool that we have for students to internalize their own sense of humanity. Um, and also for everybody who, anybody who was here last night, it's impossible not to see these students and recognize them in the full measure of their humanity when they're standing up there vulnerable as they are and expressing themselves in the way that they are. So I'm excited to get into whatever we're gonna get into. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, so even though we have a panel, panelists, can you raise your hand again so we could just 
see who you guys are. Thank you. All right, so the panelists, um, of course, they are helping us guide the discussion, but this is such an intimate space, and we're all here for a reason. This is the middle of the day of the day on a Friday, so it, it, this doesn't belong to us, all right? We are just kind of here as guiding forces, but we want you to jump in. Um, if one of the panelists, they say something specific about their work that you have another question about, if you want to explore the question, um, I consider you guys all co-moderators today. So please, um, the panelists will always start first in answering the questions, but then it goes right to you all, all right? So before we go to the next question, we're gonna go right to you guys after the panelists, because it doesn't belong to us, it's a community thing, all right? So the first question, we wanna start by identifying the other. Now, you probably like, wait, what does that mean? Am I gonna like call out like groups of people? <laughs> Not at all. Um, but how are people other, generally, in our society, from a historical standpoint, how are people othered? And why is it important to create access and inclusion? Now that seems like, well of course, duh, but if that was the truth then you wouldn't have to be here, right? right? So let's start to explore that. How are people othered? And then as a result of that, why is it important to create access and inclusion? Any panelists can start. Let's start with how do we other? I think these are hard things to think about. I don't think that's a simple question that yeah. I have to go, honestly, not from my own understanding of the reading that I've done, Audre Lorde and uh, Simone de Beauvoir. And then othering, I think, is a process that starts with defining difference. Mm -hmm. And once you define difference, then you rank difference. Mm -hmm. And the scale is basically about ranking the humanness. So that's how othering occurs. I think and that sounds abstract and maybe not helpful at all. Well, one thing I like what you said, and I'm going to be typing the whole time and Anne will be writing um, because it's a, it's, it's a living panel. And one of the things I love that she said is that once you define difference, you rank difference. And I think that that's super important because difference doesn't mean elevated, superior, inferior. How can we use all of these tools, you know? When you think of your body, you know, you have your hands and your feet and your nose and your eyes and your mouth. And all of them are equally important for you to function, you know? So you obviously recognize the difference between your nose and your mouth and your eyes and your legs, but they're different. It's not better, you know? It's not your legs, you never use your hands to eat, you only use your feet to eat because your feet are better, you know? They're, di <laughs> they're different, but it's, many it's one body, many members, right? And so I think that that was super important. So I think that's the question that we also have to ask today. So you've just sparked that one in me as well. I'm gonna, of course, let the other panelists address this question, but that's something for us to be thinking about as we move forward. How do we define difference? Because being colorblind doesn't work, because mm. then you're just cutting out people's unique gifts and talents. How do we define difference without ranking difference? So I think that's gonna be a question that you sparked later on. Thank you so much. Any other panelists want to tackle the question of how are people othered, and why is it important to create access and inclusion? Well, I, I believe that uh, a lot of it is, uh, is evolutionary in the sense that if you want to look at uh, a long uh, frame, as a historian I'm always doing that, um, we started out in uh, tribal units. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, significant to our survival, individual survival, to have a tribe that we belong to that could act as a buffer against all of the uh, predators and problems and the hostels and so on that were out there. And so as our social situation has evolved into what now is much a much more global uh, inclusive and has to be this kind of global inclusiveness if we're going to uh, survive, um, we, we still have this carryover of tribalism that uh, makes us identify with a particular group or a particular caste or a particular color or whatever, and then everybody else is potentially uh, not, um, not part of the tribe. Uh, and so that we make this differentiation, well, we don't know, are you hostile or not? You, you're, you're a little different. And uh, I think that leads to this concept of the other, and this sort of a, this, this suspicion of the other as being unpredictable and potentially uh, hostile. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I recently been working through uh, this book to help guide community culture. It's called Tribal Leadership. Has anyone heard of this before? Tribal Leadership. It is a free uh, audiobook on Zappos, uh, so check that out when you have a chance. Uh, but one of the co-authors, Dave King, 
uh, well, he and his coworkers kind of go through um, personal progression, which feeds into community identity. Uh, and he says that there's basically five stages of personal development that also create cultural development. Uh, the first, most basic stage, uh, not many of us live much of our life in that area, but its motto is life sucks. Uh, I've been dealt a bad <laughs> hand, and I am going to claw tooth and nail uh, to ensure my own survival. Uh, the second level of uh, progression is, uh, is defined by the motto, my life sucks. So maybe not all life, but my current situation sucks. Uh, this is definitely typified by uh, The Office, um, Dunder Mifflin's you know, uh, existence, where everyone is just doing the, the minimum amount to get by, hopefully going by unnoticed. Uh, and stage three is, I'm great. But even beyond that, I'm great and you are not. Uh, so stage two and three are where most people live most of their life. So all that to, to get up to the point that I believe othering happens essentially as an ego projection. That uh, the bits of you that I can see myself uh, reflected, that's going to, uh, and you know, a piece of that's physical, a piece of that's going to be cognitive. Uh, I think a huge piece of that is language, not just um, you know, French, English, Hindu, whatever, uh, or Hindi rather, but, um, but what language uh, have we agreed on is a safe language? How are we using words? How are we using tone to address one another? Um, all this to say, uh, so we can move on to other panelists, I think so much of othering happens in our own insecurities, uh, mm -hmm. in that for me to survive, like Mallory was saying, I need to quickly identify you as friend or foe, uh, threat or ally, and that's uh, most easily done and most quickly done before any conversation can even happen. Um, so I think it, it takes a, a step into stage four of community development, which is we are great. When I can include you into my experience, when you welcome me into your experience, and then, if all things go peachy, we wind up at stage five, which is life's great. Can I just say something? Yes. As per uh, stage three, which is where a lot of people are, and they may not know it, and they may have their own degree of enlightenment, the narrative that comes out of that could be a lot of different things. And it can, it, even though it has a very positive basis, it can work in a negative way by exclusion. There again, just some ideas. I, no, you nailed it. Absolutely. Yeah, that was a pretty perfect lead into what I was thinking of. Uh, someone told me something that, that really stuck with me, uh, and that was that there's this piece of human nature that says, I'm okay because I'm not you. <laughs> and we're sort of that de othering is so important. Like, yeah, I'm okay, and so are you. And that sort of sets, like you were saying, like differences are a good thing. Coming from a dance background, not something that's traditionally known as being very friendly to differences. And that's, you know, there's sort of the tech, thank God that's starting to evolve. Uh, but for me, what's so powerful about movement as an exercise of de-othering is it has this power to unify sort of your, your inner self with outward expression. It sort of requires of you vulnerability. And when you're in a group, of a movement meditation or yoga, you're sort of witnessing others and their vulnerability while you yourself are choosing to put yourself in a vulnerable state. And it's sort of like a great equalizer in that way that you're really witnessing um, sort of a, an essence of another person. So I can speak more about that as conversations. No, I, I, think but, it's, yeah. I think it's a good lead in because I think we're starting this panel as all ideas should. We're kind of like, I always tell my students, like an inverted triangle when they're writing. So you start broad and then you go, you know, narrow. And I think it's really good that we set the tone of what is the other. And you had a perfect lead into the practical. All right, yes. Okay, um, I, I'm sure where this fits into the discussion that you had, but I want to make it somewhere the distinction between the other as an individual and the other as a group. Oh, okay. um, I helped with an issue earlier in the back of the top line for all of them. Thank 
basically was to not allow any choice organizations to enforce the market because they had an agenda which I felt was uh, basically antagonistic to what the market was about. But to try to come up with language as difficult as it might be to say that individuals that had different opinions on the issue should be welcome. Uh, exactly how we should phrase that, I don't know. And I'm trying to have a lot of groups time mm -hmm. right now phrasing that. That's something that the progressive groups have struggled with for, for decades. Okay. But I uh, mean obviously there should be some inclusion of individuals who who struggle with that or who could not have the experience at least of helping them. Yeah, and thank you for sharing that. And again, everyone who's in this room, you're a part of the panel, so you're not taking up too much of our time. We're learning together, and that's what that's why you're here. So thank you for that comment. I actually wrote down for later. Um, other the other is group versus the other is people. So we're definitely going to talk about that. And how do you have inclusion with groups who struggle, whatever your cause is? So I have that written down. So you, that was a really good addition. Yes. Um, I I'm also struck by when we say the other. A lot of it is the paradigms in, in which our culture is based on, because um, I've been a part, I've been actually graced with the opportunity to be a part of ceremony with Native elders in South Dakota, and the sense of um, other is very different in other cultures. So I think we're coming from a very American standpoint about the individual that I don't know that all cultures worldwide would express the same way. So I, I think it is very much uh, steeped in, in not just our, our nature, but our nurture. So it's biological in some sense, but it's also very cultural. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you. And also, so back to that. Thank you, guys. That was a very meaningful contribution. So what you said about dance, I was thinking of the inverted triangle. It's important that we talk about the broad ideas first and then we get to the practical and everyday. And I think you made a really good segue into that. So, you know, this panel is the other, the othering through art. And you just gave us a really practical way. Um, through movement, through common movement, you're sharing movement, you're moving your body. We all have to move our bodies, right? And you're not just moving for entertainment purposes, though that's a part of it. Every movement that you choose, it has a meaning to it. You know, you're trying to communicate something. You talked about meditation. You know, there is a goal, a common goal. So when you're doing these common things, or if you're a group, if you're creating together, it's really hard to see someone as completely the other if you guys are both creating something new. You're creating it from nothing, you know? So it's completely from nothing, and at the end of it, it was your humanity that created this final product, that created this choreography, that created, you know, this, even if it's a play, the director, you know, directed the actor, it's all working in sync, it's symbiotic, it's symbiotic. and I think that's so important what you said, like, the othering happens within the performance, you know? Because how can you separate yourself when you're creating alongside something else? So I think that's a, one of our first like, really practical answers. Creating together helps the other. Yes. I want to um, think about uh, sort of the power dynamics in all of this because I think it's dangerous to talk at too great of length without contemplating who may we be talking about when we say the other, right? So there's an other for all of us. We may all have other, right? But when there are power dynamics at play and historical marginalization at play, I do think it's important to start narrowing in on who's being marginalized and being most negatively impacted by this othering process. And so I want to frame the question in those terms. Um, what are some, uh, I think one of the things that happens oftentimes is that people in marginalized communities are tasked with dehumanizing, I mean, wait, with rehumanizing themselves, right? With um, de-othering themselves. And so my question is, what are some concrete ways that any of you have seen or thought about um, that enable us to avoid putting the burden, right, 
of de-othering on people who are most negatively impacted by the othering. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to start with the panelists, yep. and then you guys will jump in. All right, anyone that wants to just start. Yeah. That question was for you. <laughs> well, I just appreciate you bringing up power, okay, and about this idea of power dynamics and, and the othering. I think requires this kind of larger accountability because the reality is we're here talking about our here talking about othering because othering actually results in people not living, dying. You know, people struggling or hurting or being exploited or what have you. So it's, there's a reason we're here discussing why othering is a problem. It's because it's life or death for people, whether it's in their health care or whether it's in their abortion to their, their access to abortion or any kind of care whatsoever, or whether it's in their access to food or their access to a proper education. These things result in certain people dying and certain people living. And I think it's important to note that we're born into the society, I drew from on what you said, but the truth is, othering is very profitable in our society. Mm -hmm. We're working against really strong forces that, that profit from society. So I worry sometimes about talking about how individuals can remedy the problem of othering when there's a power structure, a capitalistic profit structure that's so deeply invested in that. It needs it so badly that it will launch a military. You know, so it's, I, I wonder, again, it's like relying on those communities that are marginalized to, okay, so I, I, although, and I want to backtrack, for art, for me, it's about daily existing and survival in the situation we're in, right? And so I do see, though, the merit of people coming together through whatever exercise and having the interpersonal deothering experience to be as individuals to be more human. But I'm not sure that those interactions are going to lead to less death for people. You know, so I guess I wanted to add that. That I think that there has to be a societal accountability that I don't think, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't know if I lost my belief in the power of art or something. I hope not. But I wonder if it's me. It's so under the uh, capitalistic power structure that is. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think um, when I think of art, uh, well, I was just a part of an interview earlier today that focused around um, the do-it-yourself movement, uh, mostly in the in the punk scene. But this is not specific to one genre of music. You know, like every uh, artistic um, entity does have its own kind of do-it-yourself um, community that that evolves. Um, what you were saying brought to mind uh, some words of a dear friend of mine. His name's Chris, and he says that. Uh, community is only credible in diversity. That, you know, he's, he's calling it a question, is there such thing, and you were talking about uh, accountability structures, you know, with this, uh, is there such thing as claiming that you live in community with others if it's just an echo chamber, if everyone looks, talks, believes the exact same thing? Mm -hmm. um, or does this turn into a privatized struggle uh, not even struggle, but a, a privatized discipline to make sure that I have a broad perspective of people speaking into my life. Again, coming from the field of mental health, uh, I deal with issues of perspective 24-7. Uh, my, my personal belief, or my personal definition for suicide is the fatal result of a restricted perspective. When we only have one voice speaking into uh, a life situation, in this case, depression, if depression is the only voice speaking into it, then we're not getting the entire picture. And I believe the same goes with, um, with issues of diversity, you know, whether that's gender or sexuality or ethnic background, what have you. If there is a limited perspective, then there will be a limited access to life, whether that's literal or, or just personal growth. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, um, let, let me use art, visual art, as just a kind of um, uh, one aspect of, of what we're getting at and something that I have noticed uh, throughout my rather long career. Um, and that is how fine art is probably one of the 
snobbier classes uh, around in terms of the art world and the people who deal in it. A lot of them have a lot of money, a lot of them have a lot of power and influence and so on. Uh, so the art world can be very insular, you know, very, very small in a lot of ways. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, the court painter. Um, and what I've seen, if you look at art history, is, is uh, really rather um, comforting in that artists themselves have recognized a much broader base for art and have recognized art in places other people couldn't see it for a long time. I'm thinking perhaps in the early part of the 20th century, an artist like Picasso and Matisse and so on, who began using uh, African art as an inspiration for their own work and seeing what art African artists had done with uh, breaking things down into geometric forms and saying, whoa, I never thought of that. You know, I never thought of it that way. Look at this face. It's made up of geometric planes. You know, Let's explore that idea. And, and building a bridge you know, toward a, a, a kind of more global outlook of acceptance and learning and, and communication. Um, I had this really, really brought back to me. My, my special interest in our history was Native American, is still Native American. Um, and uh, I, I've written quite a lot about it and, and uh, been in conferences and so on and so forth with the Native American artists. Um, I always found Native American art uh, fascinating, beautiful, something I really needed to explore because I'm not Native American, but I want to know all about it. Uh, but I was in Berkeley one summer and uh, went to, um, they had a, a, in the anthropology department, they had a wonderful display uh, from a collection of Native American work. And uh, I went over to one of the art historian's uh, offices to chat, and I said, say, you know, they've got this fantastic exhibition of Native American work. Why, do, why don't we have any of that in the, in the gallery here? And, and he looked at me and he said, well, that's just feathers and chicken shit. And it, it, he, didn't, he didn't see it, you know, he didn't see it as art. And certainly he didn't see it as anything that was significant artistically. And I thought, wow, what a very narrow view. You know, I mean, I don't know if his field was Renaissance or what, but it was definitely Western and it was uh, European and it was very narrow. And, but, but I think through the arts is, uh, is one way to really expand the view of what is art, what is culture, uh, what are the differences that are so interesting uh, rather than maybe um, distressing. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I love the most about art is that it doesn't need words to be real. Uh, it doesn't need to be categorized. Uh, it, it's the experience is the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you ask for a specific example of the way that I've seen that really powerful with someone who maybe seen this other. In my work with teenagers, one of the most, you know, that I see is the most important things that I do um, is, is service, that we, we go out and we do the best we can to help and to learn. And the big part of that, as someone who is white and with a youth group that's predominantly white, is that we do what's asked of us. We do not, we make sure that we are learning more than we are doing and that, uh, we don't sort of encapsulate that white hero, like we're here to save the day and we're, mm -hmm. you know, bringing, you know, here we are. No, we're, we're here to learn and we're here to do what is asked of us. Uh, we don't know what needs to be done. We don't know how we can help, you know, but we're here, let us know. So when, to be cognizant, of whenever we're entering a space that does not belong to us, uh, that we ask and that we wait our turn and we, we, we honor that. And a way that I saw that so profoundly, uh, we took a trip uh, to San Blas, Mexico, and um, we were working with a, a group that had a relationship with the Huichol Indians and the Cora Indians and the Sierra Madres. And our youth group, uh, we had a sort of a little mini youth dance company. So they had a few pieces. And then we met uh, with the teens in the, the Huichol group. And they walked, we went side by side, so they were two by two, and they taught them native Huichol dances. And then our group taught them some sort of simple lyrical. And so in that sharing of movement, there was no shared language, because it was a native language and, you know, English. No shared language, but it didn't matter. They knew each other's names, and they knew each other's dances, and they formed a very intimate bond. And they were able to be blessed by the shaman, sort of really uh, significant learning. And so in that place, they, uh, our group had no power. We were there at their invitation, uh, and we were there to share and to learn. And then we were able to, uh, you know, help by 
you know, doing some work on a, in the <coughs> schoolhouse because that's what they needed and that's what they asked. But it was that that art connection that here is the movement that is sacred to us and here is the movement that is sacred to our group. Let's share it and build that relationship. That was the starting point and that was that de othering. And of course they were all teenagers and I mean nobody like looks back at like middle school and be like, those were the great days. <laughs> like, I was so confident and sure of myself. <laughs> no, it, it's already such a vulnerable place. And to be able to, to make that strong connection with someone else with that in that same age group uh, was incredibly powerful. Yeah, I think um, I've been ruminating both on what Hazel has said and what you have said. And the first thing is when you said, you know, being skeptical or like de-othering is it is the death for so many people and can art really you know stop the deaths you know that the other in causes and the reason why that resonated with me is because i think about that all the time with my poetry group and you know i have an engagement coming up where i'm supposed to be speaking and i'm struggling to write anything coherent because it, i feel like they want me to express how art has been this thing and you know they'll ask me questions when i'm struggling with my draft like are you targeting a specific population what's going on and for me in the day to day when i see what those who are other to marginalized are going through i don't always believe that my own work with poetry is always valuable mm -hmm. and sometimes i'm like is it valuable is it actually it's you know it's the othering but when they go out into that world where everyone just sees them as black and brown kids you know, do they care that they have poignant words, you know, <laughs> when, you know, when they're confronted? Um, and then I'm often reminded that it's not the full solution, for sure. I, because again, so there is this system, there's so many acts, there are going barriers that we have because of the capitalistic, capitalistic system and everything. But one way I do see, because I was thinking about that, because you challenged me, and I was like, huh, we're at this panel, you know, and, and does it, does it stop the ultimate result of the other, which is the death of lives? And I thought about my poetry kids, and I said, you know what? It may not stop it in all the ways, but in very significant ways. So I think about, for instance, it comes coming to mental, mental health. So in black and brown communities, and there's a lot of reasons for this, it's not the fault of the black and brown communities, but there's a stigma about mental health. You know, you don't tell anyone, keep your business at home, you don't tell anyone. And again, it's not, it's not because the, the black and brown communities are ignorant, because we haven't had access, because there has been shame, we've been shamed, you know, all of these things. And so many of my poetry kids, when I started this club, I was just like, we're gonna write, they're gonna write about their breakups, and <laughs> we're gonna go home, you know? And they like knew what was going on in the world, and they expressed their own hurt, and they shared space for each other. And all of these kids are kids that, well, not all, I don't wanna say that, a good, a good amount of them, not even a majority, a good amount of them are students that have no access to mental health. You know, and I do not pretend to be a counselor. I'm not certified. I go through protocol when there's crisis and I go to our school counselor. So you know, I don't pretend to be the person who can, I'm not anyone's savior. You know, not all kids are into poetry. So what do you do for those kids? You know, so I, I, I know my place. I know my lane, you know, I have this like, it's this big and like this is my little corner, you know, so I totally understand that. But one thing I have seen for so many of my kids, like in Alachua County, if we're talking about numbers and percentages and all these things. Last year it was about three to four young people. And I just found out, I don't know, I didn't realize that till yesterday, that this week, you um, had a couple. There was a couple. Um, and we have, we have so many kids in crisis. And you know, it's because they are not, um, they're not being serviced in that way. And it doesn't always have to happen through art. Or, you know, again, like I said, I'm, I'm one little corner. But one thing I've seen with my group is, these are not kids, you know, the theater program is not for a lot of them. You know, even though they, they have the theatrics and they can do it, but they're not into those plays. The debate team, while it would be great skills for some of them, it's, I mean, even in its dressing up in the suits and the whatever, and I'm not saying that my kids don't do that, you know, because I, I have kids that, are, that range in all sorts of sources. Because one thing I do hate, there is a, the other thing that happens because I'm an African-American teacher and so many of my kids are black. People, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Freedom Riders, but people like think of just another Aaron Gruwell, like, oh, you just took these kids from the streets. And I'm like, this kid is in like all AP classes and he makes straight A's, like, they're black, but like, I don't understand. And so people like really try to put that on me. And we don't have that narrative. We don't have the narrative of like, with all of them, some of them, I mean, that's just, that comes with the territory, but we don't have the narrative of like, they're black, so you rescue them from the street and you introduce them to poetry. The narrative we have is like, all these black and brown kids loved poetry before I met them. 
and had no way to express it. Like they like it much more than me. They come to me with the classics. Like they like writing. So, like, um, I would have like these people come to me and be like, so your kids, they're into the slam poetry, right? And I was like, not really. Like I trained them. Like they, they like sonnets and odes <laughs> and limericks. Uh, they actually are terrified to perform. Like they're really into the classic stuff. But one thing I said, just to your question again, is what I've seen is that these kids who don't have access because of systemic things um, to mental health or whatever, like I said, it doesn't replace a counselor, but for the time being, what their support they have for each other creating this art, they're not able to express themselves like this in English class or whatever. And I've had several kids, not to my credit at all, just to the credit of access of space, you know, and a place, have said, I was going to do it last week as in take my life. But then someone from Poetry Club shared, me, shared with me their poem or let me read it. And I'm not, this is not like, you know, donate two cents a day, you know, kind of appeal here. It's not the, sa- it's, I mean, it's their lives. So I'm not gonna ex- take the story here and be like, aren't you guys touched? Like, I'm not gonna exploit their lives. Like, these are the things that they're telling me has happened in Poetry Club. But I thought they were just gonna write about their boyfriends and girlfriends and go home. So them having access to high art, I think has helped them save their lives, you know? Or like being in this space last night, with hundreds of people here, people that are college professors. We do have a university community gap in this town, let's keep it real, all right? But having professors here and them being validated as these black and brown children gives them a sense of purpose. And I think that's the one way where I've practically seen like it leads to it leads to life in that way. And even what you were saying about the Native Americans, I'll shut up for talking so much. I'm just a moderator. Um, but what you said about the Native Americans, um, there's life even in your, your ideas. They're gonna be taught in school that these people were savages or see, you know, or see these images of savagery and they're gonna be able to question that and have a cognitive dissonance like, you're telling me these people are, you're painting them like this, you know, that they're not intelligent, that they're, they're not feeling, they're over here on this reservation somewhere. But I laughed with someone who was from a certain tribe and I think when they grow up, then they're passing on these new attitudes that art and you know, service gave them and then that changes everything, and I'm, and I'm done. It, can we want to op- open it up to everyone else? Because you guys have been so patient. You had your hand up? So, I mean, I would like to touch on several things, but I don't know if I'll get to yeah. all of them. Um, what was said before had to do with um, uh, uh, our system of making money. And, uh, yeah. And the, the othering yeah. Yeah. within the uh, in the framework of money making and the capitalist system. So so often, you know, if you have money, you'll get money. You know, somebody said uh, it's, it's good to start out with a little money. Have money. Um, <clears throat> so then we have things like implicit bias, mm-hmm. whereas a child in a mother's womb can hear the parents saying, "Those people down the street, they're horrible." Mm-hmm. And so when the baby comes out, it already knows who the horrible people. Are. That's how strange our world really is. Baby could actually acquire implicit bias inside the womb. It sounds like a crazy thing, but we now know from studies of implicit bias this is true. So then you talk to, well, let's talk about the othering with the world of nature, right? And, you know, this is one of my pet peeve rants, and excuse me, I'll go on for a minute. Uh, we have a lot of things around here called invasive species. I call that species xenophobia. <laughs> We're afraid of a plant taking over. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Okay, so we have a plant called Albizia julibris and Jurax. It's from Asia. It treats certain forms of leukemia. It's very good for anxiety. If you took too much of it, it might alter your 5-HTP system, which is the way you go to sleep at night. And it could alter it, you know, to the point where, you know, you shouldn't take that much. So plants are off limits. They are dangerous. They could be poisonous, and we shouldn't even think about it. In the meanwhile, the pharma companies which I quite not pay attention to Thank you very much. They'll do a study or several studies on plants, and then it's a boardroom decision as to whether or not that information will be absorbed and channeled into drug discovery. If, if they decide not to, the public never finds out about that discovery. You have to be somebody like me who searches NIH every day. And you can apply that to a thousand different plants here that are called invasive. It may be exaggerated, maybe it's only three. Um, but they're from all over the world. They're medicines elsewhere. They're invasive here. It's a great way of just changing the narrative so that people won't pay attention to all this incredible diversity, which is in fact not a problem, but it could become a problem.
product. If there was a a large coalition of people, but then now we're talking about agriculture. So there's a sore spot. Who's going to do all the work? Well, I think a lot of kids will think about committing suicide because they don't see a way forward. Like you say, they may not be interested in computers, they may not be for them. Maybe the expressive arts are not for them, they may be more uh, intellectually uh, inverts and not so uh, uh, much on the outside, you know, wearing everything on their sleeve. And so, you know, you have a, a gap there too as well with the knowledge system taking all of uh, botany towards molecular biological drug discovery and taking us away from nature. We don't get to play in nature because it's poisonous and toxic and danger. Don't go there. And then, of course, two kids that looked like I looked when I was 12 years old and the average die every year in the state, in the state of Florida uh, by messing with the, the Ventura plant. So there's, you know, a good cause for this toxicity. Uh, so that othering of nature is largely responsible, I think, for a lot of the suicidal tendencies because we don't have the cooling green to look at, which is good for our liver, that's good for the Chinese medicine. Uh, too much of this uh, screen time, uh, uh, you know, when you look at the screen, it's actually moving, but you can't see it moving, it's a very fast rate of the video. So that, agi that agitation of the screen, we don't even perceive it. Uh, it's below the level of our perceptive consciousness. So all these types of things are feeding people and pushing them. And you know, uh, sonnets are great because you know they'll teach you about human nature. And so will rap. You know, Thank as you long so as it doesn't offend us. So, uh, Thank you so much. So. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I can go on. <laughs> Thank you. And you also had a comment as well. Are you sure? Yep. All right. <laughs> Just, uh, you had asked uh, how we thought that art could be a vehicle yes. in which to assist us in de-othering. Yes. Okay. Um, I can only speak from my own experience right now, but I've been graced again with some opportunities uh, when I was living in South Florida as an artist to work in a public art community-led project which engaged all of the community members of the artists as well as businesses and students. And we were able to, through this collaborative effort, 
bring people together from diverse backgrounds that, you know, obviously, and it was organic. It wasn't just, you know, the city said, oh, we're going to do this. No, it was just a bunch of us as artists who said, you know, it would be really good if our city spent its money on growing the arts out of our efforts instead of bringing in these outside forces to put up public art, you know. So we, we sort of grew this effort. And I, I tell you, the day that we had the plenary, which was, it, it culminated in a final art project that was um, presented in 2017 at this International Connect Art Symposium. And the construction was all repurposed materials and it featured alternative energy. The kids were helping us weld and choose materials and everything was grown out of the, the efforts of the group. And then when we had the plenary, we had a couple of the students and all these students were from um, at-risk areas, you know, so that what they term at risk, meaning schools that weren't, like you said, where they were coming from, schools that generally didn't send them off to college after they graduated. And um, they got up there and each one of them spoke so eloquently about their efforts. And I was, I, I just got to say, I mean, for me, that was the crowning moment. Because it gave us, and I'm sorry, I'm going to start crying because it was such a, it was such an immensely satisfying moment to see all that effort that we had done to prepare um, the program and that these kids were all very um, so well spoken and they, and they all said, I want to work in alternative energy. I mean, every one of them. It, it was like it would never have been presented to them in school. They would not have even considered a, a field of science or any of that. And, and, and to have it now melded with the arts, it, it just came alive for them. Yeah, thank so, you so much. Uh, just, thank Sarah, you so much. And Sarah and I have a nonprofit, and that's one of the things in our charter is to bring Mary together the arts and sciences. Thank you. So we have a question as well. Thank you guys for all joining this discussion. What we're going to have, just to kind of make sure that you guys are actually talking to each other, we're going to actually kind of bring this question from like more broad and again just kind of make it narrow. But thank you guys for your contributions, and we're going to have you guys do that with each other. So panelists and everyone together, all right? So let me tell you an anecdote that happened to me like a last, like a week or so ago. So I had this white student visit me. And he was visiting me because he liked me, obviously, right? Um, so he visited me, he came from the um, military and he came to visit me. And we were talking about life and everything. And then very quickly it took a turn, a turn for the worst. And it ended up being a three hour discussion of him telling me that, um, with the Native Americans, it was a very kind conquering, and they simply did not have the technology or the tools. Um, with him telling me that when it comes to professional standards, because there was a time where this would, I couldn't get hired with this. Well, you have to, you know, look at the majority and what their standards are. And I mentioned like deaths that were substantiated. He was like, well, you know, it just kind of comes with the territory. And I was like, why is this happening? And um, it just went on and on and on. It was horrible. It was horrible. I went home and I cried. And then I came to school, and one of my other students. Um, had been exposed on a magazine, another white student, um, because he, on his Reddit, had said a lot of hateful things. Um, like when people would mention race in class, he would physically slump all the way down. And I would just ignore it because I'm a black teacher and this makes me feel very awkward when this happens to me, all right? So um, one of the things that the first student said to me, he talked about forced representation. And I think when it comes to art, representation is a big issue, right? Who is in art? Who's in movies? Who's in music? Who's in our paintings? Who's in, that's a huge deal, right? And he said to me, yeah, like, how can you only put this small percent of the population in, like, Star Wars or any of this stuff? Like, it's going to flop because that's, I mean, he was just really, like, just ugly about it, right? And a lot of our lack of access does come, there, there is white supremacy, you know? It, that's, that's a, re, white supremacy is a reality, you know? Um, it's, it's in every it's in every market, right? Supremacy is in every market. Even even in places that you didn't you can't even think of. I'm gonna use a really asinine example before like I can't get a nude bandage, you know? And to your capitalistic point, um, when I mentioned that as a micro example, he says to me, Well, it's the majority, you have to make money. They're not gonna print they're not gonna waste extra dime just for a segment of the population. This was a great conversation. <laughs> so even in a small micro example like that, that there is othering. So what I want you guys to do now, and I'm gonna explain how to do it, I want you guys to have a conversation and then we'll round up, but I'm gonna tell you how to do that. This white supremacy is embedded in our art. And a lot of our students 
you know, people will be surprised. Like when I have my poetry kids, they spoke well or they said this. I'm like, well, they're humans and they learned how to read. So of course not, they spoke well. Yeah, of course they spoke well. You know, like they're they can speak well. And how? So even the other ring can even be in yes. our. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to the other ring, and I'm just using mine as an example, but, but but we're gonna have we're gonna have a conversation. So the the people that have been quiet can be a part of this. So um, there are times when there are times when my students are asked to speak in certain spaces, and I am I am given the tremble. The tremble is. What are they gonna say on stage? Can we trust them? It's not that dramatic, but that's how it looks to me. All right, and I'm like, what do you think I'm gonna? First of all, it's my image, it's my job. What do you think I'm gonna, I'm gonna do? Have them? What do you think I'm gonna talk about? And oh my gosh, and and it's so amazing that those kids just come from. You know, one of the kids last night, she talked about I'm the top of my class, and you can't even see it because of my jacket and my hoodie. Mm -hmm. You know, and she's not top of her class because she's in spec. She's the top of her class, and like. Uh, medical program that she said that I could never do, you know, and my kids are quoting things and talking about marks and like all of these things and that's the difference. Once they had access to a space, you saw their intellectual prowess, you know, so it wasn't, I didn't pour anything new into them as far as their intellect is concerned. They didn't have a space on campus. They didn't feel comfortable in theater because we have a program called Cambridge and Cambridge has all affluent students. So they might like theater, but they didn't feel comfortable being in theater. Or the fees to join this, you know? Our fees are $10, and thankfully, because of Jacob's kindness, we got a lot of money, and we paid for all of their dues, so they don't have to worry about paying for club dues now, you know? So, but a lot of this lack of access comes from white supremacy. I don't have shows at my school because I don't want them to be censored, because seeing their, seeing their words, you know, theater department curses all the time. But if we curse, I don't know, the parents, you know, the tremble, I get the tremble. So I don't have space. So one way, space is a part of the other ring. So I want to give you an example of what you can talk about in your small groups. So space, Jacob gave us a space last night. You know, he gave us a space for our black and brown kids and Jacob did not give me the tremble, all right? He didn't give me the tremble. He trusted that they had what it took. So one of the ways, on a concrete way, that the other one can happen is space right now. We have to kind of keep ourselves accountable right now. We are intellectuals, you know, theorizing for part of a conference that's held by a college about the other end, <laughs> you know? So we have to keep ourselves like, you know, what does that look like? You know, how do we create spaces for people like these students? How do we create spaces so that they can have their own conversation? Like you said, it's the responsibility so many times of those who are de othered. To human, I'm human, I'm human, I'm human. So space for me is gonna, if I were to say a concrete example, I would say space, you know? That local pub or that church or that grocery store that closes at a certain time, having, giving access for our people in the neighborhood. Gentrification, hello Gainesville, you know? Oh, I was gonna name out a restaurant, heck I didn't do that. But you know, because I kind of like it, but I, but I, I was so guilty when I'm there. But you know, <laughs> you, got, you know what that means, there's a restaurant that the neighborhood people are never in, you know? And I'm like, man, it'd be awesome if that restaurant was like, let's have a community round table about the white option with our restaurants. You know, special discount for those who live here. The, the, for all the gentrified people, it's $20. For you guys who've lived in this neighborhood for generations, you pay five, you know? So what I want you to do, so space is mine. If I were to answer this question, space is mine. So what I want you to do now is just get with a partner and we're gonna answer this question, how can we use art and other means, so I think we've talked about other means, to physically actually the other. Like if we were to go home today and this weekend and we got together with someone, what could we start in Gainesville, this is changeable, right? In Gainesville to the other and dismantle this white supremacy that keeps us apart. So how is we gonna do it? You're gonna to talk to your partner for one minute, you can take out your phone and time it, you're not gonna say anything back, and then they're gonna to talk to you for one minute, and you're not gonna say anything back, and then you're gonna have a 30 second roundup where you are interacting and talking, and then we're gonna get back. So please find someone now. It can be groups of three if we are uneven. So please do that now. Makes sense. All right, so again, we want to anchor 
our share out conversation. We only have 20 minutes left, so I want to make sure that it's purposeful and that we're anchoring it. We want to leave here. We started out broad, kind of talking about big ideas, but we want you guys to leave from Changeville feeling like you have an actual idea that you can get together with your buddies and do a small version of it or something you know, in two weeks or two months. Does that make sense? So just please keep that in mind as you're sharing out. Um, we don't want to talk about broad ideas. That's, what, that's why we did that in the beginning. We really want to talk about what were the practical solutions. And also, um, nothing's wrong with personal stories. We, that was the, that's what the beginning was for. The beginning was for, hey, I've seen this in my work and I've done this in my work, right? But it's Changeville, right? So this answer, this part of the conversation is not about, yeah, I talked about how I did this, or they talked about how they did this. We talked about this concrete way. Does that make sense? So that is our goal. We talked about this concrete way. All right, so please just kind of keep within those parameters. And we're gonna ask that everybody, um, and I'm not even gonna talk because I know myself and I'm long-winded, so I'm just gonna listen. Um, we're gonna ask that um, everybody try to take no more than a minute-ish per your response, please, because it is 3.11, we have to end at 3.30, all right? But I can tell that you guys are having some great conversations. So again, what were some concrete ways that we can de-other, dismantle the white supremacy so we can effectively de-other and we can walk out to today and think about some of these ways that we can do it? Starting with the panelists and go. What did you guys learn from each other? So I took away something optimistic. That's probably a good note. <laughs> but um, I think... Space thing, I couldn't help but pop off that for personal reasons, which I won't, but like yes. this property thing, space equals property to me, which is attached to that yeah. power structure. So in in venues where we have this art experience, having some acknowledgement, like the Phillips Center, let's say, if we're gonna have some, you know, have some like accountability for how often that space has been used for white people. Yeah and just some kind of beginning to sort of tally at least the, mm -hmm. the inequality of property ownership of property use in the place of making purchases. Anybody else? I said I wasn't going to talk, but I lied. Um, <laughs> another re way is, this is a horrible term, but I can't think of anything else, so I'm going to say economic trickle down. Come up with something better, please. But um, the most poetry organizations that actually have good funding, like youth organizations, because we're part of a larger network, I'm not gonna go into that because I said I'm not doing that. They have a mechanism when kids age out that they can be hired as youth poet mentors and get paid for that. Imagine being 19 and your first job isn't at Publix, nothing's wrong with that, or McDonald's. Your first job is a good income, saying you're a youth poet mentor. And then other organizations, they actually like will go up. Like I'm a youth poet mentor, now I'm the director of this small site. And they like kind of go up this corporate ladder kind of in the nonprofit world. Um, so an economic benefit, providing opportunities for, for youth that age out to actually then create the spaces and manage the spaces. So I'm using the term economic trickle down, but that's horrible. But you guys know what I'm trying to say. Benefit. Yes, okay, yeah, benefit. <laughs> right. Shared economy, yeah. Uh, one thing that uh, my discussion partners um, brought to my attention is uh, just the idea of public art uh, being hugely instrumental, not just because it is a public statement, but that that brings the audience, uh, that expands the, the space for the audience to consume oh, yeah. that art. Uh, and one beautiful example that, that Jenna shared was uh, a, a piece of conversation you said you talked for about an hour with someone that you would have no um, business interacting with unless art was the the public and focal point of that piece of conversation so I do believe that there is space for public dance there is space for public murals there is space for public singing and and um, musicianship and whatever other public form of art which then gives the community uh, the chance to intentionally engage as a member of that audience. Uh, I'm very passionate about this idea of the audience because the audience isn't there to solely consume, but it's there to give life to this art 
afterwards, that now you can come into a bar in the middle of a Friday afternoon and discuss how that art directly affected your community. You gave life to that conversation because you were a shared audience with that individual. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just <laughs> off that, that really short, I think, um, especially uh, what I was discussing is I, I had an opportunity um, because of my privilege and where I've, all, I've worked towards it as well, but I am a public artist and have waltz that are given to me, and most of them are run by companies, and I do very specific designs for advertisement, essentially. But I'm finally at a point in my career where I'm being given opportunities to actually speak um, and say what I want to say, but I think... What's more important to me is being in the room that I'm in right now and knowing that so many people talk about what they're limited by and for so many people it is the space um, that I have. So I think one thing that I've heard one word so much today, which was access, um, I think as far as walking out the door and having something, knowing what you have access to um, instead of harping on what we don't. Right. Um, well, we don't have space, or we don't, we can't say this in front of a certain crowd, or we, you know, your poetry students are limited to whatever. Um, but knowing what you do have, um, who you know, um, what spaces are available to you in town, taking advantage of those things, mm -hmm. um, and really going outside of your comfort zone, maybe, and doing that, um, and reaching out to those businesses or individual people or a corner on the street. Um, there's so many opportunities, I think, and it's hard sometimes to see that they're there when you're limited by the things you already know you're limited by. That's a good point. Yeah, we also sort of were in the space vein and talking about, you know, there are people who will seek out opportunity for poetry and arts and, and there are people who won't. So how can we be more creative about space and where we can take the art so that people who may not otherwise avail themselves of it or take the opportunity to expose themselves to it uh, may not have the choice, where we can kind of could be not confront. Well, maybe confrontational is is the word uh, to to confront them with with art in in an unexpected way. Like, is it in a lobby? Is it in uh, on a corner? Is it in front of a public art mural? Like, where can these spaces be more creative? So people may not be planning to expose themselves to something, but mm. once they have the experience, they can't unlearn it. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh, oh, go ahead, he's next. And then you guys. Uh, I had an uh, uh, interesting experience the other day because I was part of a focus group uh, that the University of Florida graduate students uh, had put together to talk about interactive exhibitions for museums, uh, museum programs. And uh, I, one of my people that I was talking with talked about the counter groups. And, and it seemed to me this was a, a, a wonderful encounter group mm -hmm. in the sense that we were talking about art, we were talking about exhibition, we were talking about how a variety of different people and the students that put it together made sure they had sort of almost <laughs> kind of one of everything uh, in this focus group. Um, and, uh, and that the rules were you just said uh, uh, whatever you really believed about these interactive museum designs. Uh, and it was, what I really enjoyed was everybody's different perspective, because everyone reacted completely differently. Um, some of the people, you know, wanted to this, well, if you could ask if you could design an interactive uh, exhibit, what would you want to know? What would be your question to the, to the museum? Yeah, what I, hear, what, I, what I hear from you is, when I think about the other encounter groups, instead of us saying they need this, going to those places and saying, in counter groups, what do you need? What, what are you interested in? What art do you want? And then create with them exactly. what they need. Yes, and then I know that you wanted to go as well, yes. One point I just want to share, um, you were talking a lot about the race aspect, but I work a lot in, uh, work with gender, yeah. um, with, with women, and a big issue is that Find women don't self-identify or work with entrepreneurs and inventors. So, for example, with in the university, we can send your researchers, but women won't think that they're inventors. And women oh, will wow. say, I work in a company, but maybe mm. I can start my own company. And we really work to kind of shift the paradigm. So the issue, the issue of self-identification mm -hmm. is really important. So when you were all talking about being an artist, and I know, uh, you know being a musician, being an artist, we, I think part of the other, the other is recognizing that 
this is me too. And when we were, I was talking to Drew, we had the conversation and what I came up with in mind of how to share this, and it sounds kind of basic, but it's what we're doing now is a storytelling. And you know, the whole hashtag me too movement. All women have a hashtag me too story, but I know I've had more conversations in the past six months. And of course we all have stories, but I honestly say like, I don't think in my conversation, my experience, we all realize, even though maybe we knew it instinctively, those conversations, and I'm a feminist, and I'm working in the field, and I've never had those conversations. And now I'm realizing we all have them, men are now realizing those conversations happen, but so that identification is just telling your story, and 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 you said a lot of things earlier about you know language and, and with, with race of yeah. people looking at maybe color students and saying well they don't you know I'm surprised I say this but I find that in business all the time well, you know with with um, oh a woman can be it is a very interesting dynamic shift when you realize, oh, this woman, you know, she presented herself very well, and she really knows what she's talking about as a scientist. I know, I'm sure you really have that. Uh, <laughs> so I think that part of that conversation, I just wanted to bring it up, is how do we get people to, and you need to message differently, and realize, you know, you this can be you too. Maybe this is you. It's okay if you're not the best artist, but you can paint a picture, and guess what? If you write a song, you're a songwriter. That's it. Yeah. That doesn't mean awful. Yeah. And hey, my opinion, like, you know, it, I see the shit you're showing us. You're teaching people, like, guess what? Not everyone's going to like what you do, and that's okay. But just, just getting people to help identify and telling the story. So it's, it's really powerful today. Thank yeah, you. thank you for that. All righty. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for adding the other ways that we other as well. I appreciate that. Yes. Well, what I want to add, and I will provide you. It doesn't have, I mean, it could be that, or it can be like how she just mentioned gender. Sure, well, no, I have one of them for her in it. Changeville itself it is an awesome way to uh, address a lot of different activist issues. But I, as, as awesome as this group uh, that I've been privileged to be a part of today has been, uh, it, it's, it, it's just the right size. But I, I wish it could be a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it would be different if there were, but probably at the concert, you're going to be many more people. I don't know, hundreds, maybe a thousand or two. I haven't seen any besides the venue yet. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be speakers. Uh, I don't know how much coverage this is going to get the press. Probably not much to look for in international coverage. Uh, kids that are searching uh, online in Google or in library databases probably aren't going to find mention this in it. And, and they should. Um, something like this should get some national coverage. And you, you think about ways of getting at least the arts element of changeable coverage nationally. Uh, and one way that you could do it would be through taking advantage of streaming media. Uh, you could stream at least some of the arts component of it, and at least some of the workshops. It would change the atmosphere here dramatically. Um, there are some reporters and things that we are and I don't think it's changing the atmosphere at all, but if you had video cameras, a live stream going, it would change the atmosphere some. Um, some workshops would work, other workshops not other would, but it has to have that going, some streams on Periscope, Facebook, um, and just imagine you know, a streaming platform on Spotify to develop uh, and have music going to it, which would be something. Um, if you get more of that, uh, more kind of exposure you get nationally. Yeah, thank you. I think what you said is perfect because we talk about access, that's been like a repeated word, access of information. And I think that's important. You know, a lot of the ways we communicate still is kind of antiquated, you know? And um, I think about even in Gainesville, on the east side of town, for instance, um, I can't tell you the amount of people that just don't know about some of the biggest things. So I think what you're saying is really important for deothering, um, especially like where are flyers posted? Where are the digital signs, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really important as well. So I think what you said was perfect because you see the supremacy and the division when there is no like fancy digital sign on a certain side of town, where there are no posters, where, there, where, where none of these things are actually occurring, you know? So there's no streaming, there is no, okay, we're on this social media page, what about the social media page followed by this certain group? You know, do they get an ad sponsor too, you know? So I think what you're saying 
is really, really important. Thank you for that. Yes? Um, I've done these um, Unseen America photo projects. It was part of the national program where you got groups of people um, who were invisible or misrepresented or stereotyped in on the mainstream <coughs> media, and they gave them cameras to them. Um, and basic photography lessons, and they told their own stories through words and images. And um, I talked to Gail Johnson about this idea to, um, in an effort to bring the community together and have dialogue around this sort of medium. And um, she was like, we have to do outside exhibits to try to create in public parks and public places where so the people are already going, create new venues for art in those areas. And then I did this crazy thing where I priced the, um, the bus paths, and that was um, a very exciting thing to, to imagine how the people's, you know, people's images and people's stories just ride all over town on the buses and, you know, in these outdoor venues. So I don't know how it would work exactly, but I'm <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry to just cut. I don't want to cut off anyone, but I want to respect the next panel. Um, so really quickly, um, we're gonna actually get up right after I say this because I really want to respect the next panel. First of all, I'm a snapper. Can you snap it up for yourselves for being in this? Yay! All right. So Anne is gonna read our solutions, and then we're gonna leave. I'm gonna put this up there, and we're gonna write your emails. We're gonna send out all of these solutions. And if you find yourself in the next month, two, three months, actually implementing some of these things. I'm going to give them to Brandon, and we can actually keep this going and, and actually be encouraged that this is happening in real life. All right, so really quickly, please yep. read them. All right. So uh, the first one was tallying property ownership um, and use for the benefit of white identified people, sort of redistributing the usage. Um, second, someone mentioned, my hand, you didn't tell me I was going to be reading this off. <laughs> Poet mentor. Oh, economic benefit. Great, economic benefit. <laughs> for poet mentorship or uh, yeah keep going. public art expanding the space for public art singing dance murals conversations um, in space is not solely used for consumption which was just repeated um, as another idea access knowing what you have access to occupying and saying um, and making use of it intentionally number five how to be more creative about space and confronting people with art and Unexpected ways, number six, encounter groups, going to where people are and asking what they want, and then working, That's helping it. them make it happen with them. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be reading this, That's so okay. I've scribbled it down. I want everyone to see that we actually came up with real solutions. <laughs> All right, then uh, seven, women often don't see themselves in their full agency, so um, <laughs> encouraging self-identification as an artist or in other ways, entrepreneur or whatever. Uh, number eight, storytelling. Nine, coverage, streaming media. <laughs> 10, access to information. And then the last one was Unseen America photo projects um, for misrepresented people doing that outside. Yeah. Thank you. So please pass on your email and let's leave the space so the next panel can set up. Thank you so much for being here.